On today's show, NBA Summer League is underway. How are each of this year's top draft picks looking so far in Vegas? Zachary Richesse for the Atlanta Hawks, Alex Saar for the Washington Wizards, and Reed Shepard for the Houston Rockets. It's all coming up on today's Locked On NBA. You are Locked On NBA, your daily NBA podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up and welcome to another Monday edition of Locked On NBA, the biggest stories with the local experts. I'm your Monday host, Jackson Gatlin, also host of Locked On Rockets right here on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Now, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more this summer with FanDuel because FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. Be sure to visit FanDuel.com to get started. And as always, thank you so much for making Locked On NBA your first listen each and every day, whether it's on your way to work, on your lunch break, in the gym. Thank you for being an everydayer. Joining us now is the host of Locked On Hawks, Brad Roland. You can track down wherever you listen to your podcast or on YouTube or right next to me. <laughs> Just search Locked <laughs> On Hawks. What's up, Brad? How's it doing? How's it going? It's Vegas, man. We're here. There's basketball all day. Hawks stuff. NBA stuff. We're having fun. We are having fun here in Vegas. We had a, lo- a hu- pretty big Locked On contingent here, and we're still here for a little bit longer. But we got to talk a little bit about what we've seen out of the number one overall pick in the draft, Zachary Risache. Give me your just your early impression seeing him play in person for the first time. Yeah, I think he's been as advertised, I would say, through two games. Not the most like flashy, you know, one-on-one score type that you might associate with that number one overall pick, but he makes the right plays, that kind of stuff. Like and honestly, he's really tall. Not like that's surprising, but six like he's a legitimate six ten in shoes, and that is uh, stands out to me when you just kind of stand next to him, talk to him, etc. So he's been really effective so far in the little ways. It won't pop to like a casual observer necessarily, but I think he's doing what they want him to do and playing with, within the system, which isn't like always the most summer league thing in the world, but it's uh, the Hawks are pretty happy. I think he looks pretty good. Yeah, it's tough. There there are some players that are almost like built to thrive in a summer league yeah. environment, and then there are others that maybe, you know, it's not the right context for it to really garner an appreciation for what they can bring to a basketball club. What's been kind of the most impressive thing about his game so far to you? Yeah, your point there is a good one. Actually, the Hawks were playing without their planned point guard, Kobe Bufkin, their first round pick from a year ago, yeah. got hurt like this last week. And that's been a little bit tough on Richie I think. He's kind of had to be a little bit more of a creator. But the most impressive thing to me is the way he moves off the ball, which isn't like, again, not one of those summer league things that you would imagine, but he really is instinctive about where to be in a way that you don't always see with 19-year-olds, like guys who just want to have the ball and cook, and cook, cook, cook on the ball as ball handlers and trying to do crazy moves and he just does like he plays within the system it's like he's been playing in europe and he's playing that same way now he was playing on a, on a, on a high level club in europe and he's kind of just like fitting in that way which again is, is probably what will pop for everybody but something that i definitely appreciate watching him up close now it, his second game here uh, against the san antonio spurs maybe not the best showing you, you know you look at the numbers four of 12 shooting only, only one of seven from downtown why why the struggle specifically in this game yeah i think he was better in the opener but um, part of it was that where he was getting the ball in this game was not like setting him up for success, I don't think. At the same time, that is the one concern, at least one, probably the biggest concern as far as him at number one overall is like, can he create his own offense? Which he can be a, a productive and effective player without being able to do that. But when you're number one overall pick, you know this, people are going to expect you to like, be a high volume, high usage player. And that's my one question about him is like, can he do that? And tonight he, he kind of had a little, a little bit more of that. Look, one of seven from three, Sometimes the ball is not going to fall in. That's not a huge concern for me. The shooting is something that I buy. But in this sample size, it was kind of obvious a few times where it's like one-on-one, can he be? You know, we talked about like the context of summer league and how like, you know, it's, this might not be the right area for certain players to thrive. But when you when you look at just his production so far, I mean, what more would you like to see out of him as, as summer league continues? I think that they're really wanting to work with him on being aggressive. And he has been aggressive but almost being even more so aggressive in this setting, uh, letting it fly as a shooter. The passing's actually popped pretty well. He had a couple of really nice highlight passes in both in both games, but I think just kind of hunting his own shot a little bit more, uh, which is not, I don't think it's not the most natural thing for him, which I appreciate, honestly, but the Hawks are almost like, hey, go out there and be more assertive, be more aggressive. That's what I'm looking for for the most part. And then defensively, just you know, being physical, they've talked about already, he's got to get stronger. That's not a huge mystery. He's very skinny right now. But just being physical, being assertive defensively as well, kind of just like 
bowing up and using his size because when he has used his length, he's been effective. We'll, we'll duck in screens, little post ups to get smaller players. He can kind of do that, but do that more often and use your size. You, you mentioned you know being surprised at kind of how tall he. Is. It's it's always a weird thing when you when you're actually standing next to these you know massive human beings in person, six ten, six eleven, over seven feet, whatever. How does he actually? How does he carry himself off the court in you know post game interviews, that kind of thing? Yeah, I think he's a competent kid. You know, part of it is that, you know, English is not his first language. So he's like very clearly processing what he's going to say. He speaks English fine. It's just that he has to think about it a little bit harder than you and I do when he's speaking. When he gets a question in French, it's like a different guy. It's like this super charismatic. He's just flowing. And I get it. Um, but I think I think I think he's a competent kid, but he also wants to fit in. I think he said a lot of things um, that you kind of have to say about doing what the coaches want you to do. But a lot of guys will come in a little, be a little bit more me first and what they're saying. Talk about, you know, all that. I'm not, it's not a criticism of anybody. It's just that he's like, he's very, I will do whatever they ask me to do kind of thing. And he, I think he actually means it, which is not always the case for those top, top, top guys who want to be the guy. I think he wants to be the guy too, but I think he really does. He's, I think he's kind of used to fitting in the way he's been playing in Europe, the way he's come up. And that kind of, uh, I think it pretty much shows when you watch him play and also how what he's saying off the court. Last thing I got for you here, Brad. Uh, who else on, on this uh, Atlanta Hawks summer league squad has kind of stood out through a couple games and, and you know has a chance to either you know stay and make the roster in Atlanta or if not potentially you know make a roster elsewhere in the association? Yeah, the, the best prospect other than Reese was is Bubkin, who got hurt unfortunately. But Mo Gay's on this team, a second round pick from last year, certainly a a, a long term bet. Six eleven, super athletic, fly around guy. He's been, I would say, aggressive to put it in kind, in kind terms so far in summer league, but he in some flashes there. And also the Hawks like this guy a lot. Keaton Wallace they actually just signed him to a two-way contract, but he'd been bouncing around before, like, you know, six, three, six, four combo guard type. They, they've liked quite a bit on, on defense in particular because uh, breaking news, the Hawks have pretty bad defense in the last couple of years. So no, adding, adding you're telling in, what? <laughs> adding some help in that area, even if down the uh, roster a little bit is probably for the best. How will the rest of summer league go for the Atlanta Hawks and Zachary Arisa Shea, who has a chance to make the roster and who will ultimately get cut? You're going to have us covered for all that and so much more. We're at Locked on Hawks. Brad, thanks for stopping by in person for this Locked on NBA segment. It is my pleasure. Hopefully it was coherent on some level. Thank you for having me. Coming up, how does Alex Saar look for the Washington Wizards through two games? Early impressions, strengths, weaknesses, plus Bub Carrington and Kishon George as well. We're going to get there in just one moment. First, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Look, I love sports. I love them so much. I never really want them to stop, right? But as you got playoffs winding down, you get fewer and fewer games, and the sports just aren't sportsing the way you really want them to. Look, FanDuel lets you keep the sports going whenever you want. All you have to do is open the app and dream up bets anytime you're in the mood. And this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. In fact, you can head over to FanDuel right now and take a look at the outright betting favorites to win the title next NBA season. The Boston Celtics currently the favorites to re Pete at plus 300. Behind them, you have the OKC Thunder at plus 750. And then right on the tails of the OKC Thunder, you have the Denver Nuggets at plus 850 to come back and win yet another title with Nikola Jokic. So head on over to FanDuel.com for those bets and so many more and start making the most out of your summer. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. And continuing on here at Locked On NBA Monday. Look, are you still watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day? Well, how about making the switch over to Locked On Sports today? A free 24-7 sports streaming channel programmed for you every day to bring you the biggest stories in sports. Locked On Sports today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Joining us now is the host of Locked On Wizards, Brandon Scott. You can track down wherever you listen to your podcast or on YouTube. Just search Locked On Wizards here to break down the Summer League debut performances of Alex Sar, Bub Carrington, and Keyshawn George. A few of the draft picks from this Wizards uh, recent draft haul, bringing in three young bucks into the fold. Uh, Brandon, is it fair to say maybe a bit of a mixed bag here out of the gate through a couple Summer League games for, for the Wizards draft prospects so far? I'll, I'll say this. Um, if you look at um, Alex Sarr, Bob Carrington, and Keyshawn George, you see a lot of talent, a lot of potential, and they fit the timeline. You know, you've, if you look at the fact that they're teenagers, that shows you where we're at in the rebuild. You know, uh, general manager Will Dawkins is targeting really young players that 
who are versatile they, that he can develop and mold very young but very raw you know like we saw tonight <laughs> with the houston rockets game man you know alex Sar, you know you see the potential you see the star potential with him but very very raw you know he's very young you know he's got to you know add other elements to his game you know obviously he's more of a stretch four you will see him be a lot more tough in the, in the paint um you know he's got to you know the only knock against him coming in the draft was the low motor so you, you kind of see that a little bit with him but I mean, the potential's through the roof. Above Carrington is really the guy has got a lot of Wizards fans excited because, you know, he's a sniper. You know, he's a local product out of B-more. He's a cousin of – I mean, uh, hey, man, his his first game was was yeah. was real impressive. 19 points, 9 boards, 8 dimes, uh, 5 of 10 shooting, like real efficient. And, and the, uh, you know, just not – I won't say a bad game too, but just the efficiency wasn't quite there, right? Only, yeah. only you know, 5 of 16 shooting, not great from that perspective, but still kind of filling up the stat sheet a little bit. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the fact that he rebounds at his size, at his position, is something I love about him, man, because he's tough. He's got the dog factor. You know, like I said, he's a local guy. Rudy Gay's his cousin, you know, longtime NBA great. So, you know, he has NBA leaning and shit. Keyshawn George, I mean, really, I, I feel like we got a diamond in the rough with the 24th overall pick, man, because he's a kid who he can shoot the lights out. You know, defense, you see the effort there. Now, is he ever going to be a lockdown defender? We'll see. But that's the thing about the Wizards. We're year two in a very long rebuild, and we have nothing but time <laughs> to, you know, mold these guys, develop them the right way. And, and like I said, they're, you know, if you add these three picks, including the two from last year, all five underneath the Will Dawkins era, what's the common denominator? They're all young, teenagers. They're all very, very raw. But Lyle Kulabali, the same thing. Second-round pick, Tristan Vucevic, the same thing, so. Yeah, you got that's the thing is when you're at the you know start of the rebuild, you want to just get as many bites at the apple as possible, right? And you're hoping you know one, two, as many of these guys pan out into you know potentially. Obviously, you'd love them to become star level players, but even if they become quality NBA players, then that's pretty much a win because the draft is honestly kind of a crapshoot sometimes. Going back to Alex Sar here for a moment, right? Number two overall pick, a lot of expectations, a lot of weight being placed on his shoulders, kind of live up to some of those expectations. Talked a little bit about kind of the, the rebounding, the size, the motor, that kind of thing. Let, let's go with so, some positivity here, though. What's been the most impressive thing so far about his game that you've seen? Well, his versatility and, his, and the, he can stretch the floor. Now, obviously, his offensive game does need work. You know, he, you know, mid-range game, learn how to play with his back to the basket, learn, you know, counter moves, stuff like that. But, you know, when he did that sidestep three with the first game, I was like, okay, because it's been a long time. You know, you know, obviously, with Chris Thompson, we had a, a, a big that can stretch the floor. But outside of KP, you know, we had Marshall Gortat, Dwight Howard for a year. You know, we've had the modern, you know, the – the traditional bigs, but this is the first glimpse of us having uh, kind of the modern days big. You know, he played a four, played a five. So, the kind of his stretching the floor is what really impressed me with Alex Sar because, you know, it needs work, but he's, you know, he's got kind of polished because, the, you know, like I said earlier, man, with that sidestep, I mean, <laughs> you know, he shows that he can definitely be a threat on the offensive end. And I think I think too with the the rebounding right. There's a reason that the uh, that the Wizards went out and got. Why, why am I blanking on his name right now? Big man uh, from New Orleans. Valanciunas. Valanciunas. There we go. Thank you for for saving my butt there. There's a reason they went out and got him right because now it, it's going to allow Sar to kind of ease into that four or five tweener role at the NBA level because you do kind of see it a little bit right. He, he I mean he was going up against Orlando Robinson of all guys right. who snatched what 15 rebounds in the Rockets right. Wizards game and, and you know he was manhandling guys down there not just. Sorry, he was manhandling a lot of the Wizards yeah. players down there. But, you know, that's going to be something that's going to have to, you know, he's going to add to his game, add muscle, add some size over time. And then, you know, hopefully that'll help him a little bit in the rebounding department. I know you said Bob Carrington's the guy that's got a lot of Wizards fans really excited. What, I, I, is it fair to say that he, so far through two games, has been a little bit more of an exciting prospect than, than Sar at this point? I would say that, absolutely, because he – people really didn't really, you know, know what to expect from Bob Carrington. You know, you play one year at Pitt. You know, again, he's very raw, but I mean, you know, I like to be this good and still be very raw, right? I mean, the kid can play. I mean, he's a sniper. That that three point shot's got a lot of people excited because a lot of people look at him as being the point guard of the future for the Wizards. At one point, it was Jordan Poole, but when you if you look at the recent trade of Denny Avila, a twenty three year old player that we drafted, we developed, we extended him. The fact that he was so easily traded shows you that Will Dawkins is going younger and he's changing the timeline. Where players who are twenty four, twenty five, twenty five, or twenty four, twenty five years old once we're part of the timeline or no longer part of the timeline. So right now you're looking at Bub as probably the future at point guard for the Washington Wizards. And if you look at former point guards that we've had, because, you know, we've had point guards like John Wall who, you know, pushed the pace, you know, same thing with Russ for a year. You know, Jordan Poole is a guy who pushed the pace. And the fact that we were first in pace last year in the second half of the season, you know, 
he can move, he can distribute, he's got vision, he's got a three point shot. You know, he's got a better shot than John Wall, and, I'm, and that's my favorite wizard of all time. But let's be honest, John Wall was not a guy who's going to shoot. You know, from a hop center from mid range, you know, or three point range. So, hey, man, look, when when Wall got traded to the Rockets, I talked myself into him to getting become a decent spot up shooter. I was looking at these spot up catch and shoot three point numbers for an off yeah. season. I was like, I'm into it. Let's go, and it did not materialize that way. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, like I said, John Wall, my favorite wizard of all time. But we know what he could and couldn't do. He you know he made a lot of money, you know, attacking the basket. You know, collapsing the defense and. He, look, if you look at the guys on the outside, that he got paid. I mean, Bradley Bill, you can argue, doesn't get paid without John Wall. Otto Porter, I mean, he doesn't get paid without John Wall. So. Ab- absolutely. He, he made he made those guys quite a bit of money in his time in D.C. Last thing I got for you, though, Brandon, you know, outside of the, the, the three rookies, who else on the on the Summer League squad has kind of, you know, impressed you some standout performances or some names to maybe monitor, even if they're not names that, you know, are going to be a stick, you know, stick around on the Wizards, but maybe might make an NBA roster elsewhere. Oh, absolutely. Uh, there's two names to think of, Jules Bernard and Justin. Justin Champagne. Uh, these guys, uh, they kind of go back and forth between the G League, um, the Capital City Go-Go, the Wizards G League team. And the, the Capital City Go-Go has done a really good job out there uh, getting these guys in the G League ready that when the time comes to play meaningful minutes with the Wizards, they've been able to do that. And you know, if you look at the second half of last season, Jules Bernard and Justin Champagne came in, played quality basketball for us right away. So those are two guys I think that I would love to stick around on. You know, obviously they're going to go back and forth with the G League and back, you know, in the Wizards. But those are two guys that continue to perform when when called upon. So, how will the rest of NBA Summer League look for the Washington Wizards? What does the future hold for Alex Sar, Bub Carrington, and Keyshawn George? You can have us cover for all that and so much more over at Locked On Wizards. Brandon, thanks for stopping by Locked On NBA with me. Yes, sir. Anytime. Coming up, Reed Shepard already looks like the point guard of the future for the Houston Rockets. Early impressions on his play through two games here at Summer League. We're going to get there in just one moment. First, today's episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and so much more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. And final segment here at Locked On NBA Monday. Be sure to stay tuned in throughout the week for all of the exciting Summer League news, breakdowns, and analysis from our incredible panel of rotating hosts right here at Locked On NBA, including Matt Moore and David Ramil on Tuesdays, John Corrales and Jake Madison on Wednesdays, Nick Angstead and Path the Designer on Thursdays, and Wes Goldberg and Adam Mares on Fridays. And now as the host of Locked on Rockets, it's me, Jackson Gatlin, who you can track down wherever you listen to your podcasts or on YouTube. Just search Locked on Rockets. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe here to break down exactly what we've seen so far through two summer league games for the number three overall pick in this year's NBA draft, Reed Shepard. And man, when I tell you the early impressions on this guy are that he... He flat out might just be too good for summer league already right out of the gate. Like there's a very strong argument to be made that after these first two games for the Houston Rockets in in summer league, that they might just go ahead and shut him down. Uh, Similar to what we've seen in the past when top prospects who play out of their minds for the first couple games look like stars through the first couple games. And then they get shut down because the team already kind of knows what they have with that player. And obviously, you don't really want to risk any you know major injury or anything happening. But that's just how good he's been. Uh, you know, game one against the L.A. Lakers and Bronny James, game two against uh, Alex Saar and, and the Washington Wizards. And in both contests, you could just see him impacting the game in such a variety of ways, whether it's with his shooting, with his playmaking on the defensive end of the floor through two games right now. Reed Reed Shepard is averaging 22.5 points per contest on 56% shooting, 45.5% from downtown, to go along with five rebounds, six assists, three steals, and two blocks per game. That is an insane stat line for this kid to have here, you know, in the early going of his career. And he just... He has this mentality about him, you know, both on and off the court. He's just incredibly mature, very wise for his age. And that shows on the basketball floor. He's very in control of what he's trying to do. He doesn't really get 
sped up and he's such a great decision maker, understanding when to get his teammates involved, when to try and facilitate and kick out for open shots, trying to collapse the defense versus trying to hunt his own shot, just making very simple decisions coming out of pick and roll sets or, you know, pushing the pace and transition. He is constantly finding uh, Rockets now going into his second year, Cam Whitmore on the wings. Those two have established an incredibly quick chemistry with one another where he's constantly diming up cam for these dunks left, right, and center. He loves hitting him on these little, these little backdoor cuts. And it's really just kind of absurd to witness this high level, you know, guard play where it's, it's reminiscent almost. And it's, it's always tough when you start wanting to throw these comparisons out there and it is summer league. It's trying, you know, it's really tough not to be, overreactionary or anything, but a lot of the little glimpses, little things about Reed Shepard's game really do kind of remind you of like a young Chris Paul or a young Steve Nash, the way that he sees and processes the game at such an advanced level for his age, being able to see two, three, four steps ahead on a given play, understanding if I do this, then X, Y, Z will happen and it'll open up this guy. It's really hard to sit here and want to pinpoint one specific element of Reed Shepard's game that has been the most impressive because I I could sit here and I could I could focus on the playmaking and how great he's been at involving his teammates. And and he's averaging six assists per contest right now, but his teammates have also left him, you know, have sold on a few plays here and there where he set them up beautifully, either for wide open threes or easy layups or dunks right at the rim. And have either gotten hacked or pushed or just flat out missed shots. And so there's a number of potential assists that are hanging out there that he could have had added to his stat sheets. So there's the playmaking angle to consider with him. He was widely regarded the best shooter and arguably a generationally talented shooter in this past year's draft. And that has been on display. He's pulled up with ease from long distance. And as impressive as the three point shooting has been, the mid range shooting is almost more impressive. And I talked about seeing like the flashes of young Chris Paul. There's something about when Reed Shepard gets into the teeth of the defense, kind of snaking through a pick and roll, and then elevates for that mid-range jumper right there around the free throw line. And there's just, there's nothing that the team can do about it because if he gets that little bit of room to then elevate and get the shot off, it, it feels like a layup for him. Honestly, that's how, that's how simple that shot is. And that's how effective it's been so far in the early going of his career. And then, Actually, I I will settle in. I think the defense has maybe been the most impressive thing. After game two against the Washington Wizards, we had the chance to chat with Cam Whitmore and Orlando Robinson, a couple of Cam or a couple of Reed Shepard's teammates. I apologize. And when asked about what stood out about Reed Shepard so far in their limited amount of time playing with him and getting to know him, both of those guys said his hands, his active hands defensively, the way that he blocks shots because of the way that NBA stat keeping works. Now, if a player starts to go up with the ball and you swat down at it, it's not classified as a steal anymore. It counts in the stat sheet as a block. So Keeping that in mind, I mean, Reed Shepard has been so active defensively. He's just an incredible team defender. So he understands where he needs to be. He understands how to rotate. He understands how to cover for certain guys. And even if it looks like the Rockets have been beat defensively, he'll sometimes sneak in there. And there was a play against the Lakers where Moses Brown had a wide open dunk and Reed Shepard kind of darted in from the corner you know, getting and going away from his man and snuck in there and was able to just swipe down at the ball, got really active, quick, strong hands and knocked the ball off Moses Brown and went out of bounds. And he's had a number of those quick little deflection steals where he's able to get out in transition and have these little breakaway dunks. That's the other thing is he can get up. He, he recorded an insane vertical at the NBA draft combine. And we've already seen him have a handful of dunks in summer league already to this point. So the Rockets really did get their what feels like probably more than likely at this point, their point guard of the future in Reed Shepard. And for him to be able to learn from a guy who has a very similar skill set to his own in Fred Van Vliet is going to be monumental for his development here with the Houston Rockets. But it hasn't just been Reed Shepard for the Rockets in Summer League. Cam Whitmore, who is returning for his second stint in Summer League, played, you know, had a really fantastic rookie season for the Rockets. And he came back in here to Summer League. It looks like he's probably going to be shut down after playing two games. But He came in and he was a wrecking ball, causing havoc in passing lanes, getting steals, 
dunking everything in and around the rim. Uh, and it, it really felt like the coaching staff put some emphasis on him understanding how to facilitate and trying to make plays for his teammates. And here in game two, it really did feel like he stepped up quite a bit and did that when Reed Shepard wasn't running the offense for the Rockets. Cam Whitmore was out there wheeling and dealing, looking for teammates and played a much better game than I think game one of his against the Lakers, where he was a little bit more tunnel visioned, a little bit more focused on getting his rather than getting his teammates involved. So it seems like that message uh, from the coaching staff uh, was well received by him. And then he was able to implement a little bit more playmaking, a little bit more facilitating into his game here. Uh, against the Washington Wizards. Elsewhere for the Houston Rockets, one other name that has stood out through uh, these first couple games is Orlando Robinson, which probably shouldn't come as much of a shock. He's spent some time you know, in the NBA already, and so there's kind of an expectation guys with actual NBA experience should be able to come into summer league and and play a notch above or better than some of the, the fresh-faced rookies that are running around the place or some of the other fringe NBA guys that are running around the place. But Robinson's made the most of his time on the floor here in Vegas so far. The Rockets actually just recently signed their summer league starting center, Nefali Dante, to a two-way contract. And Robinson's flat out outplayed him through two games so far, uh, so much so to where Robinson's getting more minutes, he's getting more run time, spending more time with the starters. And he's just been incredibly active, really, really strong on the boards. He racked up 15 rebounds in the win against the Washington Wizards, uh, just kind of bodying some of the Wizards, the big men down low to go along with 22 points. He's definitely in a role where he might not have a future per se with the Houston Rockets specifically because the Rockets are kind of pretty deep at the five spot so far on their current roster. Uh, and it, you know, maybe he sticks around on a two way deal, but if not with Houston, he absolutely is a guy who's young enough and has more than enough upside to his game for one of the other 29 teams in the association to ultimately take a chance on him and see if he can make the make the roster somewhere else ahead of training camp this next season. But for the future of Reed Shepard and the Houston Rockets and what the rest of summer league looks like for this Houston Rockets squad, be sure to track me down. Follow me over at Locked On Rockets. That's going to do it for another Monday edition of Locked On NBA. As always, thank you so much for checking out the show. If you haven't done so yet, please consider subscribing wherever you listen to your podcast or on YouTube. Just search Locked On NBA. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, a five-star review helps us out a ton. But as always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. And we look forward to having you back right here at Locked On NBA, the biggest stories with the local experts.